apologize to everyone. <laughs> this is, uh, you're joining us in progress here on We Are Liberty. I forgot to do the intro. That's Harry uh, with the red background. I'm Chris. That's Trisha. And then this is Mittens, and that's Reinhold sitting there. So uh, for you video people, that's exactly what's going on. Uh, now, Trisha Stewart is one of my favorite people, one of my uh, best friends. She is so funny and so hilarious that I added her to the network. Her podcast is called Ginger Arky. You can find that at wearelibertarians.com. Please go subscribe to it. I was on your podcast. I don't believe we have that in the podcast feed. Maybe we should find that and put that out there. I know it's uh, up there for patrons where I read the messages from your inbox. Trisha is famous in the libertarian movement for having the creepiest DMs <laughs> of any Liberty girl. How yes. does it feel to have that distinction? Um, my parents are really proud. So, I know. Uh, sorry, I am sorry. A little tech fail. Can you see me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. We've so. got ghosts in the wire. It's the <laughs> <laughs> we have to live up to that standard. Yes. <laughs> yes. Happy to be here. Um, and I actually, I, I uh, was able to catapult myself to really mediocre success through creepy guys in my DM. So all you incels out there. Mwah. Yes. Why don't you, uh, why don't you real quick <laughs> while I, while I kind of do uh, something else on the other side of this, something else where I talk about America's favorite national holiday that was celebrated yesterday. Why don't you send me uh, some screenshots of some DMS? I'll be the creepy guy and you be yourself. Let's do a dramatic reading of a couple. Do you have I could, to except for my laptop is Kaputsky, so I am flying with um, somebody else helping me, and I can kind of pass him a note and try to have send that to you. I'll send that messenger or text. Okay. How's that sound? Okay. All right. Uh, so yesterday, Harry, as you know, was America's favorite holiday. What was it? Uh, let's see. If I remember correctly, hold on, hold on, hold on. I've got, I got the Googles to help me on this one. So I'm actually going to go to Googles. Um, oh, so, not, uh, is that cheating? He's not going to Google. He's he's going to. Oh, uh, he's going to Google instead of Duck Duck. Uh, yeah. Or, wow. Mm -hmm. This is a quite the development. Yep. Yep. That's I want to make sure I get the most popular search of what people celebrated on Monday. It's it's, uh, it's he wants the FBI to know what he's looking at. It's the second biggest betrayal after Harry. What he did to me yesterday. Um, as you know, yesterday was America's favorite holiday. It was my birthday. Uh, and oh, I had many great gifts. I got many, uh, well, many, many well wishers. Uh, as you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be the character. I'm going to be the real person. It really meant a lot. Everybody was very sweet. I talked to many great friends and it reminded me how blessed I am as a human being. Uh, I know Trisha wished me a happy birthday. Dennis not only wished me a happy birthday, but donated to my Facebook birthday fundraiser to Rupert's kids, which It'll go on till the 12th, so if you're listening to this now, you can go and uh, donate to that. But if not, then just go to rupertskids.org and donate and say, hey, you know, you don't have to give me credit. Just go donate to Rupert's Kids. They're great people. They do great work. Uh, in November, they're having a fundraiser called Tuxes and Tinnies. That's a lot of fun to go to. Um, I got many amazing gifts. Uh, the, the great Craig DaCosta, who is just such a fun guy and is always great to talk to, sent me $100 on Amazon, and I got some of the nerdiest books you can possibly imagine. I got a book on Socratic logic. Uh, I got a book on Christian Western uh, Civ logic. I got a book on uh, uh, why our boys are in trouble, uh, not about uh, barstool sports, but just, you know, boys. Finished out the Westerns. Just, so I, I bought books that were expensive that I haven't wanted to buy. Jason Doolittle so graciously donated two things of toner cartridge, he, he sent me a DM. He's like, what do you want for your birthday? I said, you know what I really want? What all adults want, which is printer ink, because it's too damn expensive. Uh, so he sent that. And um, I, I, got, uh, I got probably the, special, the specialist gift from my homeschooled friend, Jessica LaPrice. Uh, now, you may know Eric LaPrice, Trisha. He runs a podcast called, uh, I'm not sure what his podcast is, I'm not going to mention it because when Jessica said she was listening to my podcast, uh, Mr. Little Priest said, don't listen to him. He's not a real libertarian. He's not an... Oh, animal. no. Is it an agorist podcast? I think so. Anna oh. Anderson or something, and uh, I don't know what it is, but Mr. Little Priest is dead to me. His sister, however, is a wonderful, funny human being. And uh, she one day, she's homeschooled, of course, as most libertarians are. 
And she posted, I'm just a potato on her Instagram stories. And I messaged her, I go, I know you're homeschooled, but do you have any idea what slang potato is for? She goes, no. I, and so I just explained to her that it was uh, not necessarily polite. I go, you may not want to do that. So she, as a joke, uh, anonymously sent me a potato, anonymously, wink, wink, where it says Jessica LaPrice is a potato with her photo on the back. <laughs> you can see on Instagram, which made me laugh when I opened it up. Uh, we have some of the funniest listeners. I was informed by somebody who speaks Spanish that potato, slang for potato, uh, papaya or something, whatever it is, is slang for vagina in Spanish. So, Aww. yeah, so uh, set, please, <laughs> share that with your friends. Look up the word for potato and then call them that. Um, so the very funny gift from her. Uh, so I laughed when I opened that. Um, and you know who else is a gift? All of our patrons. They are all a gift. Every one of them from the folks who donate once a year uh, in a one-time gift for a dollar a month all the way up to 100 a month. You guys are all such great supporters of the show. But, uh, you know, Jason Doolittle, Craig DaCosta, Christy Avery, longtime patrons, and we really appreciate them. Uh, Ed Brehob is uh, obviously a longtime friend and comes to a lot of Libertarian events. Love running into him. Jeff Bennett is newer, and we're so glad to have Jeff. And so we're so excited to have uh, all of these uh, folks donating on our Patreon. And anybody that donates on the Patreon really helps make this possible. You know, I, I've said before, it costs about $50 a month to have a new show on the network. And so, you know, what is it costing you to participate in the We Are Libertarians network, Tricia? It is costing me nothing but my soul. And so I'm really grateful to be able to have a, uh, actually an awesome network and platform that you guys have granted me to um, spout my beliefs and other uh, random things. And she, <laughs> within like the first month, had already 500 downloads. It's up to... Uh, a thousand i think and in no time and her computer's been down which she's having help uh, get fixed yes and we've got so, lots of good stuff coming i yeah. have 10 people lined up so that's awesome and so, yeah. so you guys you patrons really help make that possible and uh, you know she was with some other folks and uh, just wasn't working for her. and i said hey come triple your audience and uh, i don't know if you tripled it yet but that's oh, for the sure that's the lie that I told you. Uh, it, so, it worked out. <laughs> uh, somebody fell for it. All right. Do you have any idea of, uh, do you have any of those messages handy or is this going to? I don't, Christopher. I've got a little bit of a tech issue. So, um, and my, uh, the, my What's assistant <laughs> is, my, well, um, my assistant is, got a new book by Doug Stanhope today and He's not in front of me. He is somewhere with his new book. Okay. Well, you've lost him forever. Yes. <laughs> Sexy, Sexy Stanhope has just, lost him. Just tell the audience to send those DMs to you. Oh, send them right now. What they would normally send to her. Just go ahead and send them to you so that you can read them. Oh, right. well, I could just forward them. Yeah. But yeah, d please send, Chris, because it was his birthday yesterday, and there's other gingers that need love and uh creepy messages I don't need and heavy breathing i have enough heavy <laughs> breathing in my inbox as it is i i keep asking hody to stop but he just won't i know <laughs> he's just chasing those nudes that's I all know. he does you know god love hody his his computer's down too hody has not left the network he's got computer problems too so we, um, we did a fun little live the other night hody and i just because and it should be by the end of this week i should be up and i've got stuff scheduled so it has to be a um, but so Hody and I just did a mobile live, which was super fun, and I really miss him. So I'm excited for him to come back because um, he's a Mormon badass. He's a, he is. He's a great guy. And on top of that, too, we have the Libertarian Policy and Politics, politics which you have an episode in there. I ha yeah. So Hody and I are kind of like the ones kind of going with that with a couple of other contributors. But with his computer problems and the uh, my wife being in an accident. Uh, about a month ago. It's been a little tough. So that's yeah. why there's been light activity in that feed, but we are going to get that up and running again here in the next week or two. Yeah, good. Very good to hear. So I didn't want to have to fire any of you people. So get the content going. Just because I've been uh, slacking doesn't mean you can. Uh, all right. And Harry, God forbid you ever do a low-key wall. He does one a year, maybe? Yeah, it's on the calendar. <laughs> I actually do get alert <laughs> alerts. Um, actually, on Wednesdays when I expect to do it, like it'll beep on my phone, like, oh, man, I should do that. And I was actually lined up to do it, but Escalja 
you know, Escalja Plus went to go hang out with his family. When I try to tell him, like, I'm his family and he should be at home. Ready right. Low key when I'm ready. Unexpectedly. <laughs> that uh, Escalja, or yeah. as we call him, Paul Copeland, uh, he's a menace. All right, guys, let's get started on the topic. We're going to talk about policing in America. Now, uh, let's all do disclaimers. Uh, I, want, I want to be clear that this is not going to be a cop-hating episode. We are, we are libertarians. We are skeptical of government power, and we will explain why libertarians find policing power to be an issue. You'll hear it as, as policing power developed and why it was developed and all that through this episode. Um, I personally do not hate police. I am skeptical about ever interacting with police because I am cognizant of the fact that police are, by and large, um, their brains are a lot of times set to a mode of you're the nail and they're the hammer. And so it can, can be dangerous to interact with a lot of them. But I do recognize that if you are a police officer, it's a very difficult job. The shifts that you work are very difficult. The rotations that they put you on for those shifts are difficult. The personal problems that breeds, it's a very tough job. It's, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not easy, and it is dangerous. And uh, I'm not a back-the-blue type of person, but I do want to say that there are individual police officers who are good. But I do think that the overall policing in America, the overall business, if you will, quote-unquote, The incentives are kind of perverse, and that's what we want to challenge. We want to challenge the system and the incentives, not necessarily those who are police themselves. If you are a police officer or or related or love someone who is in law enforcement, we're not here to bash that person or make those people feel guilty. Uh, Maybe Trisha is, but uh, by and large, we're here basically to get those people to think about maybe what what career they're engaged in and how they approach their jobs. So it can be less dangerous for not only them, but also the public. So uh, we're not going to do a cop-hating show here, but we are going to be critical of policing in America. And I just want to make the distinction that it's not necessarily about the person. It's about the overarching philosophy. Um, Does anybody disagree with my disclaimer? You're more than welcome to say no. I I don't agree with you there. You know, I smell bacon. Trisha, go ahead. Well, I, I would... I agree with the sentiment of uh, approaching the issue of I hate cops, they're worthless, um, is a really poor way to approach the subject because like you said, uh, I do think the profession itself is the issue and and the monopoly on force is the issue. I have a little bit harder of a stance on it just because I dig into it and I do a little local work on on it. But do I think every cop is a horrible person or that their intentions going into this profession were bad? No. Do I think that, you know, we should uh, uh, commit uh, violence and aggression? aggression against a cop we see on the street? Absolutely not. That's not me. I may be an anarchist, but trust me, there's plenty of egress that think I'm, um, you know, a statist or whatever. Uh, and maybe these terms are not heard on. We are libertarians all the time, just from listening to the show. So if you don't know what that is, you can, you can shoot me a DM or whatever. You, you I'll can answer. go listen to that LaPriest Kids podcast. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but um, uh, I, yeah, I would say, I don't think that they're all necessarily horrible people. I think it's a culture. Um, and the policing profession has really devolved. And I just think they need to get uh, better jobs, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Anybody else want to do this? <laughs> um, yeah, Chris, I kind of agree with you, but you know, I get kind of tossed off the idea of that like they're, they're, I think their profession puts them in bad situations, but everyone else is in those exact same situations that everyone else is in. They're, they're, it's just, you know, it's a job I understand they're also not bad police. I've got police officers in my family, you know, so I'm not out here to rag on cops. I'm upset that, you know, they support politicians and everything in a system that forces to put themselves in those bad situations. And they also take advantage. And a lot of them take advantage of that. Some of them don't. Some of them legitimately got that idea to like, hey, I'm going to help people and help my community. But, you know, so somewhere along the way, that went helter-skelter and like on the ladder to, you know, they went up there like, hey, I'm going to help people. And then they slid down the evil path. So mm-hmm. you know, I, I just like being, it, you, be, you can be, it's okay to be critical of the police officer, just like you'd be critical of the guy who picks up your garbage, the guy that you, you know, give pump, pumps your gas at the gas station. It's just another profession. I, I think that's so a really important, important distinction that I do want to mention. And I thank you for kind of jogging this in my brain, because we have gotten to a place where people who draw government paychecks, specifically cops, teachers, and soldiers, We've gone from, 
respecting those professions to almost a place where you cannot criticize those people without being lumped in as anti all that. And I, I, I'm sorry, but if you're a teacher, for instance, you draw a government salary and your job performance is uh, open up to the p- opinion of the public and uh, your job is perfectly, we're well within our rights to criticize you just as we would police officers, just as we would politicians, just as we would soldiers. Um, if you don't like it, don't work in the public sector. You are mm-hmm. working in a, in a space where your money comes from me and I'm very picky about where my money goes and how it's, uh, er, how it's used. Um, and I do think that we have gotten to a place where it's very difficult to criticize police or teachers or anybody. And I don't think that that's necessarily the right thing. Yeah, it's become a deification almost or a, pol- mm-hmm. uh, a patriotism type of, of condition yeah. where you have to be, to show your patriotism, you have to have these views and these thoughts. And, and that's part of the problem is that we need to be holding these people accountable to doing a good job. And because of this deification, because of this uh, political push to, to view those professions the way we do, uh, it prevents any sort of actual pushback on those police who are doing wrong or those departments who are doing the wrong things. There's nobody questioning them. There's nobody calling them to task. There's nobody saying, Hey, this isn't right. What you're doing. Um, just because of that. So, right. Uh, I think it's why we feel we have to add disclaimers onto this because of people on all sides of the issue and anything that takes public money creates divisiveness. Mm-hmm. Because fundamentally, remember that when you take public money, you are taking that money from somebody. It is uh, the, the common phrase is taxation is theft. But just to give you a, an example, that money is not privately created. And so, therefore, taxation has to be taken from the public. And that always creates divisiveness. Just as if mm-hmm. I, I walked up to Dennis and I took his wallet from him, he wouldn't have good feelings towards me. It doesn't, the morality doesn't change in the, in the meta. It doesn't change once it goes higher. A lot of times it gets worse because all of a sudden everybody's weighing in on a private transaction. And so mm-hmm. uh, it, is, it is much harder. So let me actually yeah. go to, let's go to the, the history oh. of policing. Did you want to say something, Harry? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. Taxation is theft, but sometimes it's a user fee, so. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Are we going to quid pro quo here? Because that's not how taxes work. <laughs> what? No, I'm not going to start that fight. Sorry. All right. No, let's, right. We're talking about the cops now. <laughs> let's stick to the cops, and then I don't right. want to have to call the police on you, too. Let's start. Let's okay. start the- <laughs> A brief history of policing. Now, as I instructed them before, I'm going to give you a lot of facts. These are by Sam Schultz, our excellent researcher. These are the best notes that Sam has ever produced for the show. Uh, Fantastic job. We're going to get probably two episodes out of these. You can go check them out on the description of every episode. I always put in timestamps so you can jump around and you can also read the show notes and see the resources and and all the research that goes into one of our shows. It's not just Sam putting together a great outline to give the show structure, but also our collective research and, and uh, following this over the years that goes into these shows, dozens of hours go into every episode. So we really try to give you good, solid information. Um, so let's kind of, I think the actual history, the development of policing gives you a good idea of what the point of policing truly is. And you can think about it in modern times. So one of the most significant experiences, experiments in early policing came in 1798. Now, that, I think, was the thing that as we researched this show that shocked me the most is how young policing is. Now, most police departments didn't start until the, the mid to late 1800s in the United States, for instance. Um, and so this is an experiment in 1798. Um, and this was the first regular professional police force in London. And they were organized to reduce professional, uh, they were organized to reduce thefts that plagued the world's largest port. The force was directed by Patrick Col- Colquhoun and consisted of a permanent staff of 80 men and an on-call staff of more than a thousand. Now two features of the Marine police unit were unique. First, it used visible preventative patrols. Second, officers were salaried rather than stipendiary, and they were prohibited from taking fees. Now, every alternative to the stipendiary system required substantial public funding and raising taxes was not popular. Also, the idea that government would become actively involved in policing via 
policing violated basic tenets of the dominant political philosophy of that particular era, which held that government that governed the least governed the best. So concerned about the threat of poli political centralization and aware that political abuses of the French or the, quote, continental police, many political leaders in England feared that a standing police force would be used for political purposes. Debate about the creation of such a force raged into the early 19th century. Now, the first modern police force was the London Metropolitan Police, which was established by Sir Robert Peel in 1829. Peel developed his ideas around law and order when he was managing the British colonial occupation of Ireland and seeking new forms of social control in the face of growing insurrections, riots, and political uprisings. So I think that it is important to note that the foundation of the very first police force was inspired by the concept of social control because of those out-of-control rebellious Irish who were being occupied. I think yeah, that's the, kind of a telling fact. They came out of terrorism, right? <clears throat> exactly, the IRA, uh, before there was an IRA. Now, the quote, peace preservation force, Trisha. <laughs> yes, uh, it's quite ironic. Um, part of that, when I was reading those notes, which you were great, that was, that was a really great uh, uh, overview of the history of policing, which is new. And I think that... Uh, when people started, uh, the Industrial Revolution happened, and where people were living in large population centers, uh, that really kind of uh, blew policing up. But before that, uh, any security force uh, was meant to, like a private security force, was meant to prevent crime, whereas these people were meant to enforce law. Those are two right. very different things. So enforcing law and keeping peace are not the same thing. Um, especially when laws are made by governments and states, and, and most of them don't have a victim. And so what happens was, uh, I think in, oh, he was talking about the first police force. They really didn't want to incentivize, um, you know, enforcing something and taking fees and, you know, just, and I know you don't want to get into civil asset forfeiture, but um, collecting uh, money, they wanted to keep it away from that. And, and uh, it, that's not what happened because once you monopolize the profession, and it's, it's government run and people have power over you regardless of if you hire them or not, and then it's going to be corrupt. Um, yeah. The Irish didn't hire those British police. <laughs> they didn't ask for that service. Right. That service was given to them. We will talk about civil asset forfeiture maybe next week. Um, yeah. and we'll have the panel back to, to discuss that. But uh, so that is coming very, very soon. That is a part of these notes. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was all uh, immediately the peace preservation force was meant to serve a less expensive alternative to the British Army, which had previously been tasked with quelling Irish resistance. Uh, now, Boston adopted the London model of policing in 1838, and New York followed suit in 1844. The creation of similar agencies quickly, quickly followed in Chicago, New Orleans, Philadelphia, and by the late 1800s, every major city in the country had created some police force. Now, however... Well, before then, cities in the southern U.S., such as New Orleans, Savannah, and Charleston, had paid full-time officers who wore uniforms and were accountable to local civilian officials and were connected to broader criminal the broader criminal justice system. What were these police officers charged with doing? Preventing slave revolts. They had the authority to go onto private property to make sure enslaved people were not harboring weapons or conducting meetings and they enforce laws against black literacy. Uh, for those who can't read, literacy means they can read. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very proud of that. Uh, um, <laughs> now, the motto to protect and to serve, adopted by the LAPD uh, in 1955, has been used as a public relations tool for the police, and it obscures the main function of their work, which since its inception has been to act in the adversarial manner towards the white wider community. So when you look at the history of policing in America, you see that social control um, is uh, at the heart of this. So, I mean, was there anything about this that surprised you, Reinhold, as you, as you learned about how it formed and what it was, what the beginning was? I mean, not really. I mean, that's kind of how I'd remembered it from before. So that's, you know, pretty standard uh well pretend history but so pretend that you're but well one thing i am i am 
kind of uh, curious about is that it wasn't always, not everybody went down that model. I mean, San Francisco did try police, private police forces for mm-hmm. a long period of time. In fact, they were still active up until mid 20th century. So, I mean, the concept of having a private police force uh, being sanctioned to actually enforce laws right. um, isn't not anything that libertarians are just, are just starting to think up and propose. This has been around for a long time, and it, was, it did work. Um, but for what happens is, is you get into the position where it's a monopoly. It becomes monopolized. So, I mean, just like right now, what's going on with the taxis and Uber and Lyft, they're trying to protect their monopoly. So they're making sure there's no competition for them so mm-hmm. that they can continue to do what they were doing without having to provide better service, without having to, you know, be concerned about the, the customers. So that's what police are trying to do now is make sure that they are the monopoly force of those laws so that they don't have to um, worry about all of that stuff. Mm. Anybody else want to weigh on the history before we move to the next part? Um, I just had a... Uh, um, to mention, I think it's interesting because, uh, you know, having come from being a neoconservative, when I would hear somebody say that uh, policing is rooted in racism, I would be like, oh, well, here comes somebody else, you know, just blaming uh, racism, crying that. But um, I had listened to a lot of Maj Tori, and I'm actually going to have him on eventually. Um, but he, he speaks about, you know, he's a Second Amendment fan, and he goes into the inner cities and kind of teaches people about their rights to defend themselves and to own a firearm. Uh, and he talks about the history of uh, uh, people taking guns away based on racism and, and policing is based on racism. And I think it's pretty apparent, uh, you know, people relied on uh, private security or, or what have you, or armies or, you know, um, soldiers to protect them. And then once we became a little more civilized here in the U.S. and, and had larger population centers, then people couldn't just call in the U.S. Army to, uh, you know, control the populace or make sure that the slaves weren't going to uprise. So they made police forces. And there is definitely an inherent root of racism in police, uh, the history of policing, uh, for sure. And if you can follow that all the way right up to today. Well, anybody who bristled at that, look at Bull Connor releasing fire hoses and dogs. I mean, Mm -hmm. it was the police who were actively involved in the South in enforcing Jim Crow and making sure that white supremacy prevailed. And it was the Second Amendment that oftentimes helped black families in the South survive because their firearm was their only alternative to police power. And the war on drugs was designed right. to combat the, the uh, mm-hmm. African-American population and the hippies. It, 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 John Ehrlichman actually said that in an interview, I think, in what, with Harper's Weekly yeah. in like 1993. He was the chief of staff to Nixon. Mm-hmm. And there was a s- significant period of unrest during Nixon's first term. There was a lot of bombings. Vietnam. Vietnam. So. And so to combat this, they, he flat out says they couldn't, they couldn't crack down on being black in the Black Panthers. And they couldn't crack down on being Democrat and leftist in a hippie. So they started the war on drugs as a way to, uh, as a workaround, basically, to infiltrate mm-hmm. the black people on the weather underground. Yeah, it was an excuse, because they wouldn't go after the prominent white kids or white right. families that were doing things like that. They would say, okay, we're going to selectively choose to enforce these laws that everybody's breaking yeah. in that community so we can clamp that community down. I mean, they, they bombed a, a building in Philadelphia and killed everybody that was in it except for one person. Because, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, of the civil rights and black uprising at the time. And there were race riots. There were actually black people shooting and killing white people as a retaliation for a lot of what was going on. It was a, the sixties and early seventies were very tumultuous time period. Yeah. And we'll see the drug on war on drugs kind of play into things, but let's uh, look at the role of policing in America. Today, there are more than 18,000 local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies who employ more than 420,000 police officers. There's an average of 2.2 law enforcement officers for every 1,000 individuals living in the U.S., and the size of the police departments vary largely by location and population. So that means for every 1,000 people, there are basically two police officers. And I saw an interesting stat. We were watching, uh, I'm in the hospital watching whatever we can Mm-hmm. find it's interesting right and a and e's doing the the live p live police yeah, department like, stuff right, right. Yeah. they threw a stat up it says that there's an arrest made in the united states every 2.5 seconds really these guys are really working overtime to arrest people mm-hmm. um 
It seems like a low number, but obvi- obviously the, the point that, I, that leaped out to me, Harry, was that you're really not very well protected or served by a, a force that low. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it should diminish any, like, like any of those beliefs or myths like, well, they're here to protect us or, you know, they're here trying to like stop any, you know, like uprising because the, the idea that like there's only just a thousand of us versus two of you, that doesn't make any sense to compute. How can you even think about per- possibly protecting that many people? Right. So obviously it's like, it should just show you like, no, it's civilization. We want to be people. People are peaceful, you know? Right. Yeah. You're just uh, aggressive. So we have to ask ourselves, are these peacemakers or are they warriors? And as you see the militarization of police, as we saw in Radley Balco's great book, The uh, Rise of the Warrior Cop, which I will link a speech that he gave that I recorded uh, that is in our feed. I'll, I'll put that in the show notes. Um, you know, he, He's documented a lot of this. In the wake of well-publicized cases of excessive force and officer-involved shootings, Police departments around the country are starting to roll out new training programs that emphasize de-escalation, conflict resolution, and empathy over more force-oriented practices. Now, that sounds great. I'm all for that. It seems ludicrous that if you have a taillight out, that a police officer is going to tase you over it and uh, ruin your life and put his boot on your neck. As we saw in one recent video, I mean, that's a low-level misdemeanor, and uh, it's going to escalate to force, like de-escalate the situation. However, members of the criminal justice community still warn that while training is important, it is not going to stem police misconduct and in some cases might be part of the problem. Seth Stoughton, an assistant law professor at the University of South Carolina Law School and a former Tallahassee police officer said in an interview, training becomes a simple solution. Whenever we're talking about something as complicated as human dynamics, as complicated as racial interactions throughout the history of this country, as complicated as policing itself, I think we should be very skeptical of simple solutions, and I totally agree with that. I think we see that in the mass shooting situation. The simple solutions just get rid of guns. Well, that's a very complex public policy question that isn't easy and might not actually solve the problem. Uh, beware of simple solutions. Now, training may help, but it does very little to change the underlying systems that govern police behavior. Though officers may receive some form of de-escalation training at, at the academy, A major problem is that this can often be immediately contradicted by the guidance they receive from their peers after moving into the field. Every cop, Stoughton says, has heard some version of forget everything you learned in training. Now it's time to learn how we do it on the streets, just like Denzel in training day. Stoughton is quick to warn that policies and procedures are different for every department in the country as are training programs. And the differences can be staggering, he says. With no national standards, two departments in neighboring towns can have completely different sets of rules and procedures. So we need to keep that in mind when we're watching these things happen. We don't know what that particular department's training is. Now, an APM report study in 2017 shows that despite growing support for de-escalation training, only eight states have officially mandated it for all of their officers. 34 states have no de-escalation requirement. In a survey conducted by PERF, or PERF, of nearly 300 agencies, they were asked about the difference and and time spent on firearms training versus de-escalation, crisis intervention, and communication. (coughs) I'm going to cough. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll, 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 (coughs) I'll have uh, Dennis read that part when Harry's done. Oh, and that's um, the live PD episodes. You can actually see the difference between the different police departments on which ones were trained with force and de-escalation training. Uh, when they were showing the Lawrence Police Department, shout out Lawrence PD, that you would watch them like de-escalate the situation. They calmly walk through everything. They're like, this is what's going on. And then they'll cut through some other town and it's bang, shoot. Oh, they're yelling at people and forcing people to the ground. It's like, wow, that was drastic. And they just went three states away. Can you, ex- can you explain de-escalation? Uh, the escalation that's sort of bringing down force and bringing the situation and calming i mostly see it just both people able to see each other as humans so they're able to interact with each other just like any all of us do the the idea you get upset uh, a lot of people go up to just the grocery store cl- clerks just trying to check out you they say hello you say hello back these these small talk communication to humanize each other so you're not just yelling at the clerk like oh you're just so slow bringing out you know bringing up my vegetables but it's like no this person's a human they work in the job they understand you are working your job you're here to do this transaction with each other and you both start and you you form a relationship it's it's great it, most cops some cops do it some cops don't 
you know there was a, a cop i used to follow on youtube his videos would talk about he was trying to train younger cops and was trying to tell them that if you came out with people and you treat them you know you escalate a lot of things listen like you've got to be on it you're if you do that you on edge all the time this one person is going to be on edge one time and how quickly they can bridge the gap of 10 feet and you're not making it home because you decided to escalate the situation yeah. The, a lot of the people see that if they mess up one thing, you start getting angry that they know they're going to see the inside of a prison cell. Okay. And once that thing, that switch clicks off in their brain, you can't do anything because you still have to follow procedure and then you're cut. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let, what is the actual breakdown of training versus de-escalation? In 2015, uh, I apologize. I got the, the we switched from, summer to fall it always happens on my birthday so like this past weekend kind of yeah. uh, on saturday or sunday i left the windows open all day mm-hmm. i woke up monday feeling like garbage so <clears throat> i've got a little bit of a cold so um now in that 2015 survey 280 law enforcement agencies reported that new recruits received an average of 58 hours of firearms training and only eight hours of de-escalation training obviously you want to be accurate with your weapon you don't want to be out there just shooting it everywhere but also uh eight hours seems a little low it kind of sends a message of what the priority you should be focusing on is right less on the peacemaking and more on the firearming bang 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 yeah right more on the pew pew uh now the survey also found that the fragmented nature of the training uh, where different elements such as using the firearm and legal issues governing lethal force are discussed often days weeks or even months apart making it difficult for officers to understand how everything fits together. So uh, there's not, it's not really concentrated together. Tom Wilson, the director, director of PERF's Center for Applied Research and Management, part of that education means replacing what he says has become the tradition decision, decision model of most departments today, described as the use of force continuum. He says the use of force continuum assumes that if someone has a rock, I use a baton. Someone has a knife, I use a gun increasing the level of force. Now, one important ruling that factors into all this is Graham versus O'Connor in 1989. The Supreme Court declared that an officer's use of force is considered constitutional if it would be considered reasonable, considering the facts and circumstances of the case from the perspective of an officer on the scene. The court added that this calculus of reasonableness, quote unquote, must be taken into account the police officers have often have to make split des- des- second decisions in often tense and unpredictable circumstances about the amount of force that is necessary for any given situation. Uh, Alex Vital, professor of sociology and coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College, warns that changing policing's war mentality might be easier said than done. Quote, it has these components that say, if the only thing that is holding society together is the constant threat of armed force, And that it's the police that make civilization possible. Well, obviously, we'd all agree that that's a a scary. Let me read that again, just so you hear what that what he says. It has some of these components that say the only thing that is holding society together is the constant threat of armed force and that it's the police that make civilization possible. Vital points out that this war narrative is maintained on a political level with police constantly being told by politicians that they're waging a war on crime, a war on drugs, a war on terrorism and disorder. Police officers are expected to do too much. At some point, Americans decided that the best answer answer to every societal ill lay in the power of the criminal justice system. Yeah, and that whole idea, yeah, that goes back to the the awful idea that you you hear what libertarians or republicans say this all the time that a uh, polite society is an armed society so just to say you know if everyone's just pointing guns at each other or we we're fearful of everyone that's that's supposed to keep us safe sounds terrible well and and what are you keeping people safe from too i mean is it really uh, a society we have right now where there's roaming gangs who are trying to destroy everybody's lives and just going around and killing everybody it's not it's not that bad out there, guys. The, you know, IMPD, honestly, is that IMPD? Right. Honestly, living here in Indianapolis in my part of town, the only time that I'm ever going to run into somebody with a firearm that has the potential to kill me is a police officer at a police stop. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's, it's, but can, I, can I make a point about that? Because I, would, I kind of agree with um, 
you guys in saying that it's it's not as dangerous as we perceive. You know, um, just because we know about everything bad going on in the world doesn't mean it's worse now. It just means we know about it. But uh, I think a lot of we we're talking about de-escalation uh, versus cops just re being reactionary and going in uh, gung ho. It's based on a false narrative that uh, there's a war against cops and it's the most dangerous time to be a police officer. And that's patently false. If you look at, at the facts, um, police uh, being a police officer is one of the least dangerous professions and the best paid for the least amount of education as well. To me, it's just a job. Um, and so uh, there's this uh, culture within police society. And I think this is one of the biggest issues you know, obviously, I don't believe in, in government being legitimate, but I know the time we live in. So we have police officers. They're the monopoly on force. But there's this um, false narrative that they're in eminent danger. And so these young men who have very little training go into this profession, and they think that everybody wants to kill them. And a lot of times it's racially motivated just because uh, they're concentrated in these cities and they're looking you know, for drug crimes and there's more drug crimes in the inner city. Um, and so they're going in thinking they're gonna be shot, which is really a false, it's, it's just patently untrue. Um, and so what they've done, what uh, government has done and you know, uh, these uh, fraternal order of police have done everything, they've made this them almost this special race of people Police are this special class of citizen. We, we have to back the blue and these people put their lives on the line and they're all doing this for you. And, and that's just all bunk. It's not true at all. And it's scaring the hell out of these police officers who are the ones with the monopoly on force and the guns and we're not. And so we're being treated like we're out to kill them. And it's just not true. The police are not there to protect you and me. They're there to enforce right. the laws of the legislative and executive branches of the jurisdiction they serve. And that's been brought up to the federal courts over and over, and it's been ruled that they do not have to protect and serve. That is a manipulation. That slogan was designed to manipulate you the same way the back the blue and all of that is. Um, it's making you think that they have your best interest at heart. And I'm not saying that they're necessarily out to get the civilian, but I just talked to a cop the other day, and I said, it's funny, when I was growing up 29 years ago, um, I don't think police were this aggressive as they are now. I mean, look, watch a cop um, on police the police or whatever, go up to a car that happens to be recording, which fortunately we're able, a lot of us are able to do that now. Look at the look on his face. He sees you as a perpetrator before he's even talked to you and he's looking for a crime. This is the way that police are trained nowadays. It wasn't like this 30 years ago. Um, and, and that police officer I was speaking to, he's like, you're absolutely right. They dehumanize the populace. They're not there to serve us. They think we're going to kill us and their job is to find a crime and make money off of it. That's what it is. I had a traffic stop recently where I was digging in my seat trying to find my uh, registration and he immediately, for the rest mm -hmm. of the stop, had his hand on his weapon drawn, uh, backed up, and I go, I don't have a gun. I'm trying to get my registration that you just asked for. Mm -hmm. I just, get your hands up, get your hands up. I mean, I'm, it is nine o'clock at night. I'm on my way to do a podcast for somebody. Like, you know, and that was a $200 interaction where somebody threatened me with a weapon because I was going 10 miles over a speed limit at a perfect, like a grown man in a costume. Basically, mm -hmm. Somebody decided that he had the authority to find me 250, maybe even kill me over that, over that, minor infraction that was nothing like it's just it's amazing to me so well, and part of it too is yeah. that it's very individualized because there are police who, who don't act like that so yeah. i i've known i know a guy who i went to high school with who became a, a policeman and he had that mindset where he was going to make everybody pay make yeah. everybody follow the law and he he saw everybody he just scowl all the time he he thought everybody was up to something and breaking the law all the time. So that's how he approached his job. Yeah. Then you have other people like when my wife had her accident, the, the deputy who I say saved her life because he got there as fast as he did and got the med line there and she didn't bleed out, um, was worried about her and, yeah. and asked me how she was doing because they never tell them, you know, what the outcome is. And, and he was very, very caring and very just like, we was really just trying to make sure we could get her up there and yeah. save her life and everything else. So, You've got it different ways, but the problem is, is that the environments that they have now are incentivizing people, yeah. incentivizing these individuals who are just trying to do their job into acting a specific way for mm -hmm. 
sometimes it's political gain or sometimes it's mm-hmm. for money, sometimes just for uh, perceived power and protection of their own. Yeah. No, I think I had, I actually did a police ride along in high school because I considered becoming a police officer because I was just a good patriot. Well, that makes a lot of sense, Chris. Yeah. And you know, this, guy was, <laughs> this guy, his name is Brian. He was, it was my hometown police department. He was such a nice guy. He'd been on the force eight years and we drove around and he just, we talked a lot about, a lot about this. And he told me, he goes, you know, I, I the job is really hard. It is, it, it is moving you, your shifts, uh, there's three shifts and they constantly cycle you. So, and they do it the opposite way that would be normal for your body clock. So like your body never really feels well rested and psychologically you just feel run down. And so a lot of guys end up getting divorced because that schedule is tough on their family. And, and he goes, and then you've got people who just are constantly, you know, every day yelling at you. And like, you never hear in the news about the police department that, the, the police department, apparently this homeless family had broken down on the side of the road on 70 and the police had pulled their money together and bought this family a car and like that kind of stuff. He goes, never, never makes the news, you know, but everybody hates the cops because they hate getting tickets. And, you know, he's like, if they just followed the law, then they'd be fine. Ooh. <laughs> I go, I go, oh, shit. I go, so, but let me ask you a question. If I'm walking down the street, can you arrest me for anything? He goes, I can find something to arrest you for. Mm -hmm. And I was 17 years old and I went, Oh, that's not good. That's not the way that it was taught to me in school. And so we're on the way to lunch to the subway. And he goes, now I want you to understand about something about police officers. They spend 90% of their time around the 10% worst part of our population. And then eventually, after about 15 years, they start to see 90% of the population as that 10%. And he goes, there's just something that happens to these guys when they're at 15 years where it just flips. And we go in and we go in and we sit down and he comes in and in walks a sergeant. And he goes, look at this fucking guy. Look at this guy driving right in front of a cop without a seatbelt on. Look at this fucking idiot. I should go out there and arrest this fucking idiot right now. And Brian just looks at me and he goes, see, and I go, you're, yep. He, he just, he saw a guy who was a criminal who didn't have his seatbelt on. Now that guy is not committing a crime that hurts anybody else. That moron not wearing his seatbelt, if he gets into an accident is dead and that hurts that guy. It doesn't hurt anybody else. Right. But he saw a criminal in that. And so it was very instructive to me in the way that the police see the world And so, yes, a lot of good is done. A lot of bad is done. But at the end of the day, the more we're asking police to do through the legislative and executive processes, the more we're overburdening them. What happens to any cog in a machine that gets overburdened, Harry? You're uh, of an engineering mind or any person who works in a place that gets um, uh, overworked they start mm-hmm. burning out like we we are asking too much of police officers and a lot of times a lot of the things that and you'll see this as we kind of go through the some of the research we're asking police officers to do things that they probably don't even want to do they don't think is right but it's their job they're following orders and so if we want better policing then maybe we should stop passing so many laws yeah it, it, start holding them accountable correct Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the only thing we really want is them to be treated just like regular other citizens out of second class, not a mm-hmm. second superior class. The other thing with the uh, p- policing class is like they think they they see the worst. Talk to a social worker, but laugh They're like, "Oh, you think so bad? Wish I had a gun when I had to talk to these people." They don't think about a gas station attendant. You want to see? You want to know who sees the worst? Ask a gas station attendant who's working that when the Powerball is over, um, you know, hundred million dollars, they see the worst of society. They see it. Uh, talk to a web director. Yeah. <laughs> Someone who's on social media managing it all day. Oh my god. Yeah. See the worst. Of, <laughs> we, they see the worst of society. Please. Yeah. <laughs> um, Trisha, did you have something you want to say before we move on? Yeah. No, I, I think it goes to the point. I think you're being pragmatic about it, but. Uh, at the end of the day, and maybe this is just the anarchy in me, um, no one forced them to be police officers. I was born a white girl with red hair. I can't unbe a white girl with, well, I could. I could fake it. Or I could be like that one Rachel, what's her face, and pretend Dolezal. I was black. Yeah. But mm-hmm. um, you 
you choose to be a police officer and enforce immorality the same way this guy chooses to walk down the street and go work at Starbucks. You can leave it or take it. And I, I would say that uh, this whole police thinking they're victims is also a really big issue. Uh, they feel like they're victims of something. I don't know anybody else who can get six months of training, start off around $40,000 a year in Ohio. That's not a horrible starting salary for, say, a 20-year-old. And then work their way up to 50, 60 with a pension and, and unbelievable benefits and a get out of jail free card and that they really aren't accountable for most of their wrong actions. I don't know anybody who can get that kind of career, uh, but police officers. So for them to think they're some sort of victim, walk away. Uh, once, once you enforce immorality for so long, just like you said, that guy got said 15 years in, yeah, well, it started to eat at their soul because they've been committing evils against their neighbors for so long right. that they don't, they no longer have their own moral compass. So I, I just, I really dislike that whole poor cops. They deal with the worst people walk away. I'm in customer service. You don't think that I deal with bad. Look at my DMS people. <laughs> <laughs> I know the worst people in the world, but yeah. um, I just, they're they're no different than you or I in the fact that they're human beings. No, I don't advocate violence um, against the police. I work to train to change legislation here in Northeast Ohio, but at the same time, I really don't have much pity for them. Right, and and I I don't really feel sorry for them as much as I want to make sure that we change the environments that they're operating in because I think that's really the key. Even you know, I, I'd like to see less you know victimless crimes being on the book so that they aren't able to uh, do the three felonies a day thing where, you know, everybody commits some felonies during the day. So yeah. they can, mm -hmm. anybody can be arrested for any time for something. Um, let's get those off the books. But the main thing is we're letting the police departments become more militarized and see people as non-human, mm -hmm. desensitizing them to that, to that polite, to the things that they're going through in their daily lives too. And those who speak out against it, those who try to call out their own for misconduct, they're getting fired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? How, you, how do you get that to change, uh, mainly when you still got a whole group of people for political reasons are just mindlessly saying back to police on everything, and whatever, give them whatever they want, mm -hmm. you need to be free. Ever since 9-11 happened, it's just been this – switch to where we we want to be protected we want to be safe i'm like that you're never going to get that if you want to be protected mm -hmm. you want to be safe at all times then you should support them putting video cameras in every single room in your house and have it, all the wires fed back to the police department so they can monitor you every day to make sure nothing's ever going to happen to you i think the police shows play a part in that too yeah. mm -hmm. um, i think law and order we we actually just had a tweet on twitter uh yesterday by the empress of meme who runs our twitter um, you know, she made the point that SVU and uh, law and order in general, it has deluded the public into thinking the criminal punishment system is just and competent. Mm -hmm. It's deluded the public into thinking that internal affairs and police have an adversarial relationship and it glosses over routine civil rights violations by main characters. So I think it does play a role. I think you also see in all of the uh, the police shootings, the big names like Philando Castile, nothing happens to these guys. And I think it'll be a huge test when you see um, the, what, what's her name who uh, broke into the guy's apartment and killed him. She's on yeah. trial. They overcharged him. Mm -hmm. And if she gets off, that's just a tragedy. Yeah. That's a, a Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the SVU thing t is kind of ironic because that's put out by NBC. Yeah which is really in bed with the Lear group, which is yeah. a bunch of left-wing progressive type of mentality trying to put, force those beliefs into those shows. So if you watch SVU, the stories are usually about something political and they're trying to make a point, a yeah. political point. But at the same time, they're glorifying the police, which you don't normally see with that side mm -hmm. of the political spectrum. It's Used really to. weird. Used to. But if you want the Green New Deal to pass, you definitely need the police. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's changed. I mean, Social I, control. When I was growing up, you know, we were hippies. We, right. we didn't want the man hassling us, as it were. So, um, Let's talk about the, militariz the militarization of police and SWAT. Uh, SWAT teams, because this has been a big change, the SWAT teams. Um, 
Vital says, look at uh, what heavily armed SWAT teams actually do. They're not fighting terrorism. They're, going, they're not going after barricaded suspects. They're not fighting off armored bank robbers. They're serving low-level drug warrants in poor communities. That's absolutely true. A 2017 uh, examination by the New York Times revealed that thousands of these SWAT raids in which officers issue warrants through forced entry into homes called, quote, dynamic in- entries. You'll hear that term. So, again, that's yeah, officers that issue warrants through forced entry into homes called the dynamic entry occur every year and that while their toll has been mostly ignored by governments at all levels, they've continually led to avoidable deaths and multi-million dollar legal settlements. That same piece reports between 2010 and 2016 that at least 81 civilians and 13 law enforcement officers have died in such raids. The no-knock process often begins with unreliable informants and cursory investigations that produce affidavits signed by unquestioning low-level judges. On average, most of the searches yielded little more than misdemeanor-level stashes or nothing at all. You can see a full list of fatalities on our show notes. The Tao says it's gone a long way towards fostering the kind of military ethos in policing that has contributed to some horrible shooting incidents, said Vital. He also points out that SWAT forces are usually not required to complete any form of force reduction training at all. Instead, especially in smaller departments, they do the exact opposite, receiving additional military-grade hardware, worst-case scenario training, and actually training with former military special force, force units. Um, now, Trisha, I'm sure you have a lot to say about uh, SWAT units and no-knock yes. raids. Go ahead. So, so no-knock raids are basically what they do is they take the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution and they shred it up and then they take a big poop on it and then they light it on fire. And what, <laughs> what has happened with this is that um, – so with no-knock raids and police militarization, I think you know about Pazikum and Tatum and, um, you know, obviously you need to have reasonable uh, – uh, uh, cause to uh, have a search warrant, a, l- a larger judge has to sign off on it. Well, they basically disregard all of um, what the safeguards were against um, uh, individuals from the police force. And they've militarized them, meaning that, um, you know, when you're on the battlefield and you're in the military, obviously you still have rules of engagement, but it's not the same here at home because these are our citizens and, and we have these protections from the constitution and they progressively taken these protections away. And what basically happens is, so the police can do a dynamic search warrant, which is just such bullshit selling point crap propaganda. That's called, I'm going to break your fucking door down, whether I have a good cause to or not. A lot of times they don't find anything. Um, and then any recourse, so the citizen goes back and sues, and a lot of times they do win some money, and of course, who pays that but the taxpayer. But uh, it basically, the police don't get in trouble for it, and it's deemed to say that these police um, have power over what is constitutional or not. So if a police officer feels like, say, this person's going to flush more drugs or this person has something, if he feels like he is going to do better with a search warrant without knocking or, or saying, hey, I'm here at your location, this is the reason I'm serving this warrant, then that actually supersedes the Constitution, and he is allowed to do that. So what you've given police departments is better rules of engagement than you've given military, uh, mm-hmm. and it completely decimates uh, illegal search and seizure, and there's no recourse, and we just keep moving from this window. We're never going to get back to it. Uh, and people that, you know, say we just need to go back to constitutional rights and stuff. Well, we're so far gone from that. The police are, um, they are judge, jury, executioner, and authors of the Constitution. Now, Trisha, have you ever had a dynamic entry? I have not, but I've had some run-in with the police. <laughs> have you? <laughs> a dynamic entry, Chris, that sounds so bad. Uh- <laughs> you know, that's the way that it was intended. <laughs> yes, I, I know. I know. The government oh. goes, you son of a bitch. <laughs> hey, Chris, wait. So, so this is the big wall show. So, you know, I say whatever the hell I want on my show. Am I allowed to say whatever I want on here? Yeah, okay. absolutely. That could be yeah, something yeah. that was. the swears. Yeah, Gotta watch the swears I mean, in the big show. Go yeah, dy- dynamic entry by a cop would be completely um, undesirable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and, uh, yeah. Oh. I was go ahead. Say, like, the, Hi, Harry. Uh, yeah, the idea of like, oh, they're gonna flush more drugs down the, you know, down the toilet. Shut the water off. Yeah. Well, and isn't that counterintuitive to the idea? So if you think there's such a small amount, then it's not worth busting oh, yeah, somebody's no store down. Correct. Yeah. 
if it's a big amount, but you don't think they can get to in time, well, wouldn't that mean that you just present the wart and go in? Like that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah. Plus, they're, how much they're, so violent. Yeah, they're so violent. We have to breach this way. Yeah. I mean, look at, yeah. look at what happened in Houston where they no knock raid no, into the, the house. It turned out to be the wrong house. They wouldn't admit that it was the wrong house for weeks and weeks. Yeah. Killed two people and the, mm -hmm. um, the police lawyer or police uh, union rep was on, was on TV claiming about how this is, you know, horrible and how we're treating police is so bad. And it's like, yeah. right. They're the victim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that just goes back to that point. Uh, uh, you know, they may do a payout and have to pay the victims a certain amount of money, and that hurts the taxpayer. But the, the officers rarely get fired um, because they're found to be not guilty because of, um, you know, it didn't matter what the law said, they felt this certain way. So it, it's taken it like it, this police officer's emotions at the time superseded the law. That's why the Fourth Amendment doesn't mean anything. Right. And I just so, had that, that police doesn't... encounter. And, and the police officer didn't even know what the Fourth Amendment said. I was just, my mind was blown. Drunk, but but the victims aren't, aren't supposed to be, have a, the right mindset, right? So right. We, we forgive the cops for having a specific mindset and they act in, in a wrong way. But if a victim or somebody who's getting pulled over by the police, if their mindset is, oh, my God, I'm, you know, this is scary and dangerous and they're supposed to act with a gun in their face, they're supposed to act a certain yeah. way. And if they deviate, it's your fault. Right. Now, Harry, uh, a police officer may not know the Fourth Amendment, but a drunk Trisha Stewart sure as shit does when she's talking to a police officer. <laughs> this is so I, I won't go into the details. Number one, I am not in trouble with the law. I happen to be in a situation where I ran into the law. So because uh, I'll hide some personal information. But um, I am a white girl in Ohio. So I might have a little more privilege than say somebody, a person of color might have speaking to the police. Um, and I don't live, I live in a suburb. It's, it's not a dangerous area. Um, but the crime was victimless and it wasn't, I would just happen to be with somebody. And so I, I happen to um, know my rights and my, the rights in my uh, state. So I know that I don't actually have to produce my photo ID. If a police officer asks me Now, normally I would, I'm pragmatic enough and I have to kind of weigh, I, you know, I have kids and I have to be smart about, but uh, the officer being a passenger at, at this stop said, and you, can I have your ID? I said, I don't have to do that. And they were fairly calm at first and I wasn't being, uh, you know, obnoxious or swearing at them. Obviously I'm, I'm not that stupid, but uh, everything they asked me for, I knew it was well within my rights not to give them. And I would state why I knew this was, and, and I don't have to give that to you, that's the law. And I would say to them, do you understand the law? Because you're the one enforcing it. Now, they didn't like that very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, and so I was in the, the end of this situation. And I would say that the, the sheriff that I was involved with was a much more level-headed, but I think it was more of a good cop, bad cop thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I did talk to him a little about, about um, agorism and avoiding <laughs> uh, anyways it was a long conversation it was a long night but, but I, it was bad <laughs> I to go to subway and there's yeah. drunk girls have you heard of my oh. serious spooner oh, wait. Wait, 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 listen. Her meme bank. Hey, look at these memes i didn't decide shit you bitch i did oh yeah and i did he goes um may i search your uh purse before I, I, cause I, he gave me a ride. Cause he's like, do you, I said, I want to get in this car. He's like, don't get it. He's I'm like, yeah, I'm not stupid. I'm not getting in the car in front of you. So he said, can I give you a ride? Uh, and I said, yeah, I would appreciate that. Otherwise I'm going to stand over here and wait for an Uber. And like, there was no blings on the Uber. And so, um, number one people, I wasn't driving drunk or anything like that. It was just a situation anyways. Um, so he said, can I search your vehicle? I asked that of everybody I said, no, you may not. I wasn't born yesterday. And then he goes, do you have any weapons on you? And, and I just looked at him. I'm like, no. You know, he let me in the car. I, I spoke to him a little bit. Just this um, pin. I will write a letter to you. Wait. Not. No, I wasn't drunk. I had a couple. But um, um, I did ask. There was two younger officers, and they were real gung-ho, you know. And, and I was talking to them. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I probably have to get home because I have to go to work tomorrow because you guys rely on my welfare to feed your families. They didn't like that very much. Um, such, such privilege. Such privilege. Yes. Yes. Well, I actually have to perform a service. You proud uh, taxation is theft, tell you what. <laughs> but I did, I did ask the, the youngest officer, who's probably the most hot under the collar. Like I said, that the uh, uh, sheriff, uh, he wasn't terribly, um, he was pretty level-headed. But 
I said, he was talking about, you know, I said, are, are you taking this vehicle? What's happening? I said, you can't take my purse and I'm allowed to take anything out of here. And I was just kind of naming off some uh, local uh, laws that I knew about. And I said, do you even I'm understand? Section 69. <laughs> wait, wait. I said, do you understand the Fourth Amendment? And I go, have you even read it? And he goes, yeah, I've read it. Just like that. I swear to God. And I go, what does it say? <laughs> gotcha. He couldn't answer it. He's like, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> it just kept going. And I just thought, this is just. <laughs> I don't have to tell you is the most yeah. great school shit. It ever. was. It was. It was like a four. And he was probably 23, 24 years old. Like, so maybe like three or four younger, years younger than me. But um, it was just amazing to me that I, I wouldn't consider myself, uh, you know, somebody that has uh, studied years and years of law enforcement and the law and the judicial system. I just have a somewhat working understanding and I go to some meetings for some local groups and I am not a police officer and those people are, and I know more about the law than they do. That's a frightening, that's a frightening thought. It really is. All jokes aside, it is. Yeah. Right, Cause we don't require them to have like what, even a pre-law degree. You right. know, I would just, I'd set up for just a, you know, like a sociology degree, you know, just something, a degree. How about that? You know, just something, a passion, something in the humanities. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know i would say can i fit, can i end the real quick oh, the sorry. story chris they yeah. did say one thing funny at the end and i swear to god apparently they said this to my boyfriend when i was out of earshot because i was you know espousing what um illegal <laughs> search and seizure <laughs> I, mean, don't, don't, I swear to god i will read wrath for you <laughs> well he they, they look over at him and apparently they had pity on their face and they said is she always like this <laughs> So uh, that's a phrase he uses often. Well. I, swear to, I swear to you, Dennis. Trish and I have been on the phone late at night, and she goes, "Can I read to you?" I like I like to read my kids' bedtime stories. I go, "Sure." She starts reading Lysander Spooner to me. It's a good bedtime story. I swear. She, to she tried to put me to sleep by reading Rothbard once. It's yes. very funny. She goes, "Can I read to you?" It was actually very sweet. It was very cute. Yes. Well, natural law is great. And it's just, it's a short read. But then I think I tried to read you some economic essays from Mises. Yes. I think you might have hung up on me. I was asleep <laughs> within seconds. <laughs> out so quick. Uh, but yeah. But so let's go back to the SWAT teams and uh, let's talk about the history of the SWAT team. It was pioneered in Los Angeles, of course, and other big cities. All good statism really takes place in Southern California in the late 60s and early 70s in response to civil unrest and raging firefights. Today, almost every police agency with at least 100 officers and about a third of the smaller ones either has its own full-time unit, full-time SWAT team, or participates in a part-time or multi-jurisdictional team, according to the Bureau of Justice stats. Once the teams were formed, their existence had to be justified. Drug searches became the answer. Dr. Peter B. Kraska, a criminologist at Eastern Kentucky University, estimates that the SWAT deployments increased roughly 15-fold between 1980 and 2000 as the war on drugs escalated. There's no way to know the true number of forcible entries because there is no federal mandate that police agencies report on SWAT operations. Only two states have required it, and efforts by news and watchdog groups to compile national figures have been frustrated by police stonewalling. Uh, there's lots of sirens in the background. Uh, hopefully, Reinhold and I live. Utah is currently, we've been swatted, Harry. You were right. <laughs> uh, Utah is currently the only state that reports annual data about tactical raids. Results show that many departments use dynamic entry almost by default. SWAT units in Utah did so in 61% of 1,016 deployments reported in 2014 and 15. About 40% of the warrants they served were no knocks, usually for drugs, mostly at night. Maryland had a similar reporting requirement from 2010 to 2014, where 90 percent of 8,000 SWAT deployments during those years were to serve search warrants, and more than two-thirds involved forcible entry. Firearms was, were discharged in 99 operations. Civilians were killed in nine and injured in 95. Officers were injured in at least 30, and animals were killed in 14. Among the cities examined in the recent ACLU study was Little Rock, Arkansas, where the SWAT team broke down doors and detonated flashbangs in more than 90% of 147 nar narcotic search warrant raids between January 2011 and 2013, according to the Times. Deadly outcomes did not slow them down, by the way. 
In 2010, two team members were shot, neither fatally, and a suspect was killed in a no-knock raid that uncovered half an ounce each of marijuana and crack. Ooh. <laughs> Less than two years later, a SWAT officer was killed and ar- killed an armed 31-year-old man during an early morning raid that turned up three marijuana plants. The unit then conducted five more raids in the ensuing two weeks. Um, what distinguishes SWAT raids from other risky interactions between the police and citizens like domestic disputes, hostage takings, and confrontations with mentally ill people is that they are initiated by law enforcement. Police tacticians argue that dynamic entry provides the safest means to clear out heavily fortified drug houses and to catch suspects with the contraband needed for felony prosecutions. Critics of the forcible entry raids question whether the benefits outweigh the risks. The drug crimes used to justify so many raids, they point out, are not capital offenses. And even if they were, that would not rationalize the killing or wounding of suspects without due process. Forcible entry methods have become common practice over the last quarter century through a confluence of the war on drugs, the rise of special weapons and tactic squads, and the Supreme Court rulings that have eroded the Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches. While officers are typically seeking narcotics, there have also been deaths and serious injuries when warrants were served on people suspected of running illegal poker games, brewing moonshine, and neglecting pets. In 2011, officers in Marine City, Michigan, conducted a dynamic injury raid to serve a search warrant for, quote, any and all evidence pertaining to graffiti, including but not limited to spray paint containers, markers, notebooks, and photographs. After forcing residents to the floor at gunpoint, they found nothing, according to the depositions by the residents. The Defense Department's excess property program distributed more than $6 billion in military vehicles, weapons, and other equipment to law enforcement agencies since 1997. So all that stuff that was in Iraq and Afghanistan is now on your street. If you go to your county fair, you'll see the tank there just to remind you of your place. Uh, until last May, the Pentagon required any transferred equipment to be, quote, placed into use within one year of receipt. Uh, From 2010 to 2015, an average of at least 30 federal civilian rights lawsuits were filed a year to protest residential search warrants executed with dynamic entries. Many of the complaints depict scenes in which children, elderly residents, and people with disabilities are manhandled at gunpoint, unclothed adults are rousted from beds, and houses houses are ransacked without recompense or even an apology. Louise Milan, 68, of Evansville, Indiana, alleged in her filing that she and her 18-year-old daughter were handcuffed in front of the neighbors during a door-busting 2012 raid prompted by threats against the police made by someone who had pirated her wireless connection. At least seven of the federal lawsuits that have been settled for more than $1 million in the last five years, they include a $375 million payment in 2016 to the family of Yuri Stumps, an unarmed Farmington grandmother, Stamps, the unarmed Farmingham grandfather who was accidentally shot while uh, compliant and on his stomach, and $3.3 million in 2013 to the family of Jose Guernera, a 26-year-old former Marine shot more than 20 times as agents broke into his house in Tucson. No drugs were found. Officers received constant messages about the dangers of the job, which can further ingrain officers with the false bias that they're stepping into a war zone, one with enemies on all sides. So... Obviously, the militarization of police is a huge piece of this puzzle, and I'd encourage everyone to follow Radley Balco and also read his book. And, or, or if you're lazy, just go listen to that talk that's in the show notes because I think it's very instrumental. Follow him on Twitter, too. Yeah, he's great. Um, so let's start wrapping up. Uh, we're going to do a part two on this because there's lots more information to give you, civil asset forfeiture, and we'll actually hear a response from police officers about how they feel about doing their job. Uh, I'd love to hear if you uh, have listened to this and you have anything that you'd like to say before part two, editor at wearelibertarians.com, and uh, I'll consider reading that on the show. But uh, let's start going down uh, the line and wrap up with our final thoughts. Trisha, at the end, we just kind of say anything we missed in the episode or our general opinions or self-promotion or whatever. But I'm going to have Reinhold go first so that uh, he shows you how it's done. And then we'll give... Uh, Aw, thanks, Dennis. Show me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Show you what we do here. Um, <laughs> All right. The one thing I wanted to bring up, too, about the the, um, the SWAT teams, 
it started in the late 60s and 70s because the time in the 60s and 70s was very tumultuous as we talked about before yeah. uh, a lot of stuff was going on there were uh airliners being hijacked there was you know all the all the race stuff and the unrest that was going on the 68 con- democratic convention and the riots there um since then though the crime rate in this country has fallen over half of what it was then yeah. so i'm not sure why we need to swat teams when we have a lot less Right. Of the reason for it, other than the fact that they will try to say, well, us being here and being the SWAT team is what's brought it down. And I yeah. just really don't buy that. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But um, really, I just wanted to say that people really just need to start seeing each other in a better light, uh, individuals. Um, it, and it's something I'm probably going to go on a rant on about something else later on, but I just noticed that over the past few weeks as I was spending a lot of time in a hospital, uh, just how the way you interact with people changes how they interact with you. If you're, if you treat somebody with kindness and respect that you don't know, they're going to respond back in kind. If you treat them with hostility and, and defensiveness, they're going to pull back in themselves. And I just, my wife was just a perfect example of it with everything that she's going to through. She was always kind and um, emotionally open with the doctors and everybody and the nurses and everybody else that was there. And they would go out of their way to make sure she was taken care of a little bit better than what they made with someone else who was, you know, kind of being a bit of a pain. Cranky, so yeah. um, just something I think that would even in policing, if we start treating people that way, the police would see people as this is just another person who's just wanting to get home to their lives and they're not trying to hurt anybody, not trying to do anything and, and approach it that way. They're going to get a better response back from, from the person they're interacting with. Yeah. That interaction can go a lot better. They can part and just say, Hey, you know, I'm sorry I was wrong. And they say, okay, don't do it again. And you can eliminate a lot of this. Yeah. So that's kind of where, where my rant is on that. <laughs> Um, I can go on a longer one later some other time, but that's pretty much it. All right. All right. Uh, Trisha, do you think you got the hang of that? I do. Thank you for showing me, Dennis. <laughs> I showed her um, how not to do it. So now let's see how no, do the it was actually, opposite of what it, I did. It was actually really heartfelt. And I, I think you're right in the fact that, like I say, even just principally, I, I you know, obviously – security would always be needed. And I, I don't believe in government monopoly of police, but it has increasingly gotten worse. Um, and you look at the statistics of like, you know, arrests of rapists and thieves and, and murderers, as opposed to, you know, nonviolent criminals nowadays, it's the numbers have gone like this. And I think that because is because police are being trained not to look at people as humans. So I think that's a great, um, that's what we as libertarians should do. We should look at people as individuals um, unfortunately, cops are being trained to look at people as the enemy, and they're just like you said, Chris. They're we're the nail, and they're the hammer. Uh, what scares me the most about the militarization is that, um, although the National Guard sometimes does this, um, Hurricane Katrina or whatnot, um, we're not really used to seeing military occupy our streets. So what we've slowly done, what the state has slowly done, and police. Uh, officers and departments all over the country is they've slowly turned police officers into military. They've militarized the police slowly over time. The problem is that we're not recognizing it and there's little to no accountability. And so we're shifting this window um, over to where in the 1980s, you see a police tank go down the street. You're going to be like, what in the world is going on to where we slowly moved it over to maybe 10 or 15 years from now. It's just going to be the norm. Um, you know, say President Trump says this is a bad situation and, um, you know, I, I need the police to go in here and take control of the situation just as they have in riots. Um, I just think that's become really normal to people. And to me, that's the scariest thing in the world. As Americans, and I'm saying this as an anarchist, but as American citizens, we, the hair should raise on the back of your neck. When you see a police officer dressed in black, you can't see his face and he's holding an assault rifle. I think that should make the hair stand on the back of your neck. Who is your enemy? You know, and, and so I think that if we can just kind of get back to what a police officer's job is and hold them accountable, um, you know, make them just as accountable for their actions as they think that you should be for your actions. Um, and, and maybe that's not looking at them as some special class of citizens, but 
uh, when they, you know, commit a crime themselves, and, and if they're uh, being charged with something, say maybe busting somebody down somebody's door and shooting them when they weren't even supposed to be there, they should be held accountable the same way you and I would be. Would be. Um, I don't understand why we think that they're better than us. A uh, police officer is a human being, just like you or I, maybe some days. Um, so I like that point, Dennis. So uh, I do think that the militarization of the police is probably – uh, one of the scariest things that our nation is facing. And uh, if we don't start holding them accountable, it could change the face of the nation within the next 10 to 15 years, I predict. Very good. Harry? To add on to everything that the two of them said, uh, I think the whole the makeup of the police are is wrong you're right they have changed they've moved to these different uniforms they've they certainly went from that dark blue to now it is black mm -hmm. uh, villains wear black and so they should probably switch to all white uniforms you'd be surprised how much different they would probably be and how nicer they'd be received if they didn't wear all black you know wear wear an all white uniform uh yeah. This seems sort of hypocritical, uh, Ryan. <laughs> well, don't you think so? What what is, this has got to be about black and white. I, don't I know. Get this. this seems a little <laughs> hypocritical coming from Harry, who not only is black, but also is wearing a black hoodie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The difference is um, I don't use my gun to shoot dogs. so You could be uh, Obama's son. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm full black. He's half. Anyways. Um... <laughs> You know, and there, there's a lot of different things that the cops do. They do they go in and abuse people that they know are peaceful. Speed limits are kept artificially low so they can pull people over speeding because most people who are speeding, it, this is going to be easy stuff. Like, oh, this is so dangerous. No, the person who's speeding, they're late for work. You're pulling them over and you you know this is going to be easy stuff. You want to stop these people because stopping the coke, uh, the, the coke dealer down the street who's got a better gun than you, you do, they're highly funded more than you do, and everyone they've got is on making more than you are, and they will shoot you. So you rather deal with the guy, man, he's late for work. He's 10, mile, he's 10 miles over the speed limit. I'm dealing with that guy. You know, be honest, we all do it. We all make the decision on, on who we work with and work with, like, huh, who I don't want to talk to. I'm going to get a supervisor and bust this guy for doing something wrong, or I'm going to mess with a VP who's really messing up. Hmm, I'm going to come and talk to mess with the supervisor real quick. You know, you, you know exactly who you're going to mess with, ba uh, debating on like a. Um, it, it really gives light to the idea of move to Somalia where there's armed gangs. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't it all reality, like, you know, like they're, they are the armed gang. You know, you know, mm -hmm. they are the ones like a lot of people is like, I really hate the thin blue line stickers and to come and take it. It's like <sighs> they are the ones who are going to take your guns. Who do you think it is? <laughs> they, they literally poisoned 10,000 people. Police poisoned 10,000 people to death yep. during prohibition. They're yep. going to take your gun. And, I, it and was it's purposeful, too. It wasn't right. like it was an accident. They purposely did that to inflict that damage. And I think it's clear right. to say that it is not the police that are the armed gangs. They are just the hired thugs of the people that are uh, operating the law, the people that you voted in, basically. But, but there, that's the most dangerous thing. I, I don't fear uh, men in marble halls. I fear their enforcers. Right. They have no arms. They're impotent without enforcers. So you can blame the law and the politicians all day, but they're impotent if there's no man to carry out their, what their word says. Ooh. That's what police do. Impotent yep. and man. Well, She's and, really challenging the manhood of police. That's right. <laughs> there's also something to be said about, okay, let's, let's decide if we want to go private police forces. Do we go back to the time of the Pinkertons? Yeah. Which they did not care about. Heck yeah! Or anything <laughs> like that. They were... They would just do whatever they wanted with no accountability, almost like but, the police are so ineffective but, in L.A. that there are private security. There's private yeah. security everywhere. I realized that when I was in an In-N-Out Burger and there was a security guard with a gun and I went, oh, LAPD is so useless that a fast food restaurant has to oh, have us armed security. Guard. Hospitals full of the hospital police now yeah. and you have to go through a metal detector to get to the emergency room yeah. Methodist now. Can I address the Pinkertons though? They were they sure. were just real quick, way off topic. Thanks. You're gonna be really appreciate having me on the big show, Chris. They were um in bed with the government and they are kind of a result of the government. So. yeah, I mean that's that's part of the problem. <laughs> you've got yeah, you've got the the government making these laws telling the private police force to go out and take care of it and yeah. turning a blind eye to all the abuses that they were doing, just like they're doing to the regular police. Right. But, you know, 
there's got to be accountability and, and the people have to be able to push that accountability. There's more of us than there are of them. We should be pushing to the politicians and saying, you don't fix this. We're going to vote you out, but somebody and is going to do it and mm-hmm. you're going to enforce our will. And I think we've gotten away from that in this country where people are just like, my vote don't matter. It doesn't matter. All the account, the, well, the, the police accountability. Are, yeah. We have to be able to say we're the only people who can fix it is us. We have to collectively decide that we're going to force it to be changed. And I just don't see that push happening uh, because the politicians right now are just trying to keep us uh, at each other's throats and divided so much and so divisive about everything that we we can't get together and make those changes that need to be made. Yep. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is part one. There will be a part two. Uh, can everybody be here next Tuesday? All right, I'll ask you off so. here. Then. All right, so. <laughs> so I'm making it. Join us next Tuesday. We'll talk about civil asset forfeiture, and we'll finish up policing in America. This has been We Are Libertarians. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much to our patrons, and thank you so much to Trisha and Harry and uh, Reinhold for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. You have any uh, thing that you'd like to say back? There is something called Speak Pipe on WeAreLibertarians.com. You can leave a voicemail. Or you can send me an email at editor at wearelibertarians.com and we'll uh, respond to it next week. Thank you for listening to this episode and we'll see you next week. All right. Hold on. Typical 